The events in the following episode took place in March 2018, during the second and third weeks after Adea Shabani went missing. I'm in the psychology laboratory at the University of British Columbia in Canada, and I want you to listen carefully to the following short series of interviews with Subject A. She's a volunteer in a very unique study on memory. That's, I, I, I don't, I feel like I've, I don't think I've ever been in a fight. 14, apparently. 14? And the police were involved. Mm-hmm. They called your parents, that's all they found out. What? <laughs> that's crazy. I, honest to God, I, I don't remember fighting anyone. Now, listen to what she says during her second meeting with researchers the next week. And I think she was maybe like talking to all of us that I, I was kind of the one who said something back and then we started getting an argument, just the two of us. In her third meeting a week later, she finally recalls the fight as well as the police arriving to break it up. So, okay, um, I think the cops showed up and we were kind of having a maybe a, like a verb, verbal kind of fight, and then it kind of maybe got to a push. Mm-hmm. And then at that point, there was kind of cops coming, and they were, you know, I think there was maybe three. What's interesting about this study is it's not that she forgot this fight. It's that the incident never actually happened. She's never been in a fight or had the police called in her life. The researchers here were implanting what's called a false memory, or false belief. They didn't need machines to go into the brain and rearrange the neurons to do this. They just needed to speak to the subject a few times. And soon, no memory developed into a vague memory, into what's called a rich false memory, full of specific details that never happened. So, uh, this is a false memory study. And the reason why you couldn't remember the second event of particular police contact was because it didn't happen. Oh my god. I'm watching these videos with Dr. Stephen Porter, one of the researchers on the study. He says he was shocked by how easy it was to just implant these false memories. And though the study has become controversial in the scientific community, one thing is clear. If we don't have objective proof, like a video or audio recording, then even our most vivid memories may never have actually happened. Ultimately, we want that belief to transform into sort of a a visual sensory memory, right? So those are really the three steps. Could have happened. Okay, it did happen. Okay, I remember it happening. Unless you have corroborating information, There's no way of knowing whether it's true or not. And so that's sometimes my opinion in legal cases. It's like, I don't know if this is true or not, but because of the techniques that the police interrogators used, it's very likely that this is bullshit. And he's right. Because it turns out that not only was Angel wrong when he described a tip about Adea being drugged and coerced into a truck outside her apartment, but that the tipster himself was experiencing false memory syndrome and also wrong. I'm able to state this for a fact because I now know with 100% certainty exactly what happened outside Adeya Shimani's apartment on the day she disappeared. Chapter 5, The Video. We've been trying to get video from the apartment building from that day. LAPD apparently got a warrant, finally got the video. Uh, Specifically, it shows the garage. The video shows had some suitcases, her and Chris. Hold on. She has suitcases with her. Yeah. And how many suitcases did she have? They together, I think, had two. 
suitcases? So that sells the story of the, that she's going to this funeral with Chris, of his uncle. Yeah, I mean, as far as they're saying, it's she went down there of her own free will, was got into his truck, into the passenger side. And she got in the passenger seat of his truck, yeah. not into the back of no, the truck. No, no. Yeah, this is, this is refuting that story. It's only been a few days since I started investigating the disappearance of Adea Shabani, and things are happening so quickly that I can barely keep up. Today, I'd intended to investigate the discrepancy between the tip that Angel, Adea's friend and employer, said he received, and the tip that was actually given. But there's been new information. Jaden, the private investigator, recently obtained surveillance video from Adea's apartment building that shows Adea with suitcases, very comfortably getting into the passenger seat of a truck belonging to her boyfriend and fellow acting student, Chris Spots, on the afternoon of her disappearance. She doesn't appear to be drugged or coerced at all, and certainly isn't being thrown into the bed of the truck. What I want to know is, why would Angel mislead both of us? My suspicion is, and not really in a bad or, you know, evil way, but I think Angel got this story and I think he put it in maybe a different context to try to get more interest from PD, you know, to make it look like something really happened and tied it back to Chris because I think he really believes that Chris was involved in her disappearance. And so I think it's one of those cases where you're just hearing what you want to hear. And then you kind of manipulate the story to fit a narrative that gets you more traction. Even if what Jaden is saying is true, it doesn't explain why the tipster was wrong. Either the tipster called in and the tipster was wrong because he put what he saw into context and he saw the flyers and said, oh, this must have been what happened. Or he called in and said, hey, you know, I saw this one day. I don't remember when it was. And now all of a sudden that got transformed into it happened that day. Right. He told me it was the same day. Who did? The tipster. Okay. So then maybe he tied it together. I discover that Jaden's theory is actually correct when Adea's friend Wayana from Macedonia shows me her text with Adea. Turns out that Adea and Chris were in an argument a week before she disappeared, and he got into his truck and locked the door. At that point, Adea jumped into the bed of his truck, and he pulled out of the garage with her inside. So it appears to be a case of false memory syndrome. The tipster likely conflated this event with Adea's disappearance, and then became very confident in this richly, accidentally constructed story. So what are the police doing about Chris now? I mean, I think it's getting stronger and stronger. Now you're placing him and her together, leaving on a trip. That's pretty strong to be looking at him. What's the next move then on our part? Well, I think we've got to continue to try and establish what he's doing now and try and make contact because that's the one thing that throughout this process except for that first day, nobody's been able to make contact with him. Chapter 6, Young Frank. I'm going to be honest with you, he was, he was dating this Adea, whatever her name is, Adea. I didn't know her until he started telling me something. He's, he says, well, she fell in love with me, Dad. She, she did this. She wants me to move in with her. And I'm like, really, son? I said, you you can't do this to Mary. You know, she's a wonderful girl. And he's just kind of like, oh, you know, I wish you guys should well, you need to be honest with these girls and tell them, hey, you know, whatever you want to do, you know. He liked Mary because she was funny. She's not a very beautiful girl, but she's very, she got a lot of money. And she took care of my son. The voice you hear is that of Chris Merez. He's the father of Chris Spots. He lives in the countryside outside Sacramento, California, and operates a laser light company and sells horses. I'm trying to find out where Adea went with Chris after they left her apartment. According to Adea's friend from acting class, Christiane, Adea said she was going with Chris to his uncle's funeral in Sacramento. And now that I've seen the suitcases, the story seems to check out. 
So I'm speaking to Chris's dad to find out where this funeral was in Sacramento and if Adea was there. I didn't know anything about that. Supposedly she was going to, like you probably know, you know, going to your brother's funeral. What the fuck? My brother's not dead. That doesn't even make, make sense. Why would he tell her that we're coming up here? And if he brought her up here, she's going to her funeral and the fucker's not dead. He's not even in the hospital. It doesn't make sense. It, 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 it's it's fuck. Just to be completely sure that this uncle story is a lie, I asked Chris Merez if his son could have been going to the funeral of another uncle, like maybe his mom's brother. But Chris Merez tells me that his ex-wife and her family all live in Fort Morgan, Colorado, and have no connection with Sacramento otherwise. He also tells me a lot more about his ex-wife. She did all this shit. She changed my son's name illegally. She put an N in the paper saying, you know, if I don't respond, well, of course I'm not going to respond because I live in California. She married this crazy guy. But I'd say God is good because when he turned 19, 18 years old... I interrupt him after a while and ask him if he thinks his son had anything to do with Adea's disappearance. He tells me he's not sure, but then curiously, he directs me to a video of his son acting. Go on YouTube and look at him one. There's one he talks about how he loves this girl. It's, it's crazy. I mean, it's like, you don't mind boggle you when you watch it. It's kind of talking about how this girl wants to, to ruin his life. This was, this was six, this was like a year ago when he did this part. You gotta, you gotta look at it, dude. It's on YouTube. I don't even know what to say, dude. I saw it. I was like, are you, thought, I, it's just, it's too unreal, man. I threw away my gun once to get her love. And I was going to do it again now. Because I know that's what she'd want me to do. I was going to do it. Yeah. You know, and if I picked up the gun, if I made the sacrifice, my life would be given back to me. Did you know that it, that he was bringing a day up to see you that day, or, or not at all? No, but see, I, that's the thing. He didn't tell me any of it. He was coming up to see me by himself, and he said, Dad, I just want to get away, and I, and I nothing. Yeah, and then Monday when he told me that, that her friends, and I asked him, I said, well, what happened? He goes, well, I, I didn't want to tell you over the weekend, but, uh, you know, we got in a fight. I, was, I went to break up with her, give her a key, and she said, give me a ride, and then she started hitting me, and then uh, I told her to get the fuck out of the truck, and that was it. We're starting to narrow in now on a specific window of interest. First, we have surveillance cameras showing Chris and Adea leaving her Hollywood apartment that Friday afternoon at 1.20 p.m. Now, according to his father, Chris then arrived in Sacramento around 7 p.m. that evening without Adea. So somewhere in those roughly six hours, something happened between Chris and Adea. I asked Chris's dad exactly what kind of condition his son showed up in that night. He just came up, came in the house, like, I mean, dude, if you had seen him, fuck, he was normal, you know? It, you know, he, there was nothing. You know, I'm fucking sitting there watching the Western, drinking some wine, and he started fighting with me, and I'm, I'm just gonna go stay in a hotel. It was like, fuck. And then he took off, and in that Monday, I knew nothing about this. What were you guys fighting about that night? About his mom. I told him that I had full custody. The judge was giving me full custody of him. And she, mom said, if you get back with me, I'll get back with you if you drop the attorney. And I did. He never knew that scenario. He said, Dad, why didn't you take me? I would have had to go through the shit I had to go through with my mom. But I don't know if he had this all planned that he was going to get in this fight and take off and go to the hotel. You know what I'm saying? It was kind of weird. Things are starting to look very bad for Chris Spots. My impression after speaking to his father is that his father actually suspects his own son. Notice the way he said that Chris might have pre-planned the fight. And why did Chris Merez direct me to watch his son's acting reel? That clip, which is called Young Frank, almost sounds like a confession. And when I checked the date it was uploaded, it was just six weeks before a day's disappearance. Chapter 7, Above the Law. I 
Imagine now that you are the mother or father, brother or sister of Adea Shabani. And you now know for a fact that on the day she went missing, she was going on a trip with her boyfriend, Chris Spots. You now know for a fact that Adea told her friends she was going with Chris to the funeral of his uncle. You now know for a fact that this is a lie because Chris's uncle isn't dead. You now know for a fact that the story Chris gave Adea's friends that they broke up around her apartment building that morning and she said she was going to harm herself is completely false. Because not only did they get into the car together afterward, but on video, they looked completely amicable. This is Adea's mom, Nora. We have this person who knows something. I'm not saying he knows everything, but knows something. And we cannot get access to this person. And you don't think he knows everything? Maybe he knows. I just want to believe. Actually, I want to believe that he knows everything. But I'm also considering other possibilities. If he dropped her, if... uh, you know, left her on the highway or left her somewhere. Maybe something bad happened to her afterwards. But in any case, she was in the car with you and you know where you dropped her. Where, when, we we need this information. And you know, you get a sense that you have a person who is above the law and can do anything to, to play with all of us. I mean, even as a human, I think he should pick up the, the, the phone and say, this is what happened. There are many questions that need to be answered. Do you feel that there's sort of uh, an arrest coming? Or do you feel like it's just the further time goes away, the more he's getting further away? I don't see the arrest coming because I don't have any information that would make me believe that the arrest is coming. I only fear that uh, he's gaining time to build a strategy to hide the evidence and to basically walk out free from this thing. Things start to look even worse for Chris after I speak to Jaden. It turns out that after calling and texting Chris multiple times, Jaden finally gets a call back. But not from Chris, but from a lawyer who says she's now representing Chris. And the lawyer offered up yet another story, that Chris and Adea were on their way to Magic Mountain that day when they got in a fight, and Chris supposedly dropped her off in Santa Clarita. That's the story she told, was that they were going to Magic Mountain. The attorney told that story. Like, she didn't say, what what did you tell them? (laughs) I mean, because that story just doesn't make any sense. I mean, even, even she should have said, hey, that story doesn't make any sense. Like, I mean, that's what I would ask my client. I'd be like, so you went to Magic Mountain by yourself? So you went home back to Hollywood? No. Oh, you just drove to Sacramento for a trip. Yeah, okay. That's real. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. When someone is deliberately avoiding the police, changing their story, and now lawyering up, it seems that this would give law enforcement some reason just to bring him in for questioning. If he's not hiding anything, why is he being so evasive and telling so many different versions of the story and not helping anyone at all. He says that he's running around because she went missing and he's afraid of her family. That's what the attorney said. And and to to PD. Her family? I ask Jaden. Yes, he says. Supposedly, it's because her father is affiliated with the Albanian mob. So if he really believed that her dad was part of the mob, wouldn't it just be a death wish to do something to her? I would agree. I mean, the thing is, like, he didn't make that up. If it, if if he were the only person that ever said that and everybody just categorically denied it, then I would say he just made that was his cover story for acting the way he did. But everybody knew that. How do, wait, first of all, how do you first hear this? Through Angel. And why would Chris think this? I mean, I think she told him. 
I'd assume it's like a family. And if someone is a, you know, suspect in your daughter's disappearance and they're not getting arrested by the police, you, maybe you would ask for a favor from somebody. That's what Angel came to me and said was going to happen. He said that the dad was sending people to deal with it and that he was going to meet with Nora to discuss it. And that, you know, then I subsequently found out that she, you know, said no. Well, there we go. I mean, that kind of answers it then, right? Yeah. You know, where there's smoke, there's fire. Like everybody talked about it. So there has to be something to it. Let's review the three completely different stories that Chris Spots has either directly or indirectly told others about the last time he saw Adea. The first is from Adea's friend, Emma. And he's like, I went to her apartment. I said, when? He said, Friday. And he said, so I broke up with her. And the only thing she was telling me all the time that she's going to hurt herself and that she's never going to see me again. The second is from Adea's friend, Christiane. I knew, I knew that, that she had to go to Sacramento, and she did mention that she was going to go probably to the funeral of his uncle. And the third one is from his lawyer. What's the story then? So they were going to Magic Mountain, and then he dropped her off at Magic Mountain? Everything Chris Spots has said, through his lawyer and to Adea's friends, about the Friday she went missing, seems to be inconsistent, in conflict, and for the most part, provably false. Only this new Magic Mountain story hasn't actually been disproven, but it seems highly suspicious. He's so sloppy with his alibis that at this point, it's hard to see him as anything but guilty. We're getting word that Chris is apparently up in Colorado. He's in kind of the town where his family lives. It's about uh, maybe 90 minutes uh, kind of northeast of Denver. And that's what LAPD is telling me. Um, we've been kind of talking about some options for that. I mean, obviously, Nora wants me to, you know, make some, some big moves. And I think that trying to talk to him may be one of those moves. The LAPD continues to say that he's basically stonewalling. I mean, other than the first time that he's talked with them, uh, he's uncooperative. So I'm trying to talk to um, detectives over there and um, want to get their blessing to go up there and uh, try and talk to him. And I think it's, I think it's a good option. But first we need a good plan to get him to talk. talk to me. We have to figure out an angle or a ruse where it's actually in his best interest to speak to Jaden. Forget the police. Convince me that you had nothing to do with it. And I'll go back to the family if that's truly what you're worried about. I can tell her father, this guy had nothing to do with it. And I can say, yeah, you know, her dad is a dangerous dude. No question about it. How do you think, you know, tell him, how do you think it looks? I'm here so that, so that you can convince me so that I can tell them this guy had anything to do with it. Yep. And I'll tell you, because you look like a nice guy, you're just a regular guy. Yeah, going around killing people. All right, man. All right, man. Good. Have a good trip. Yeah, I land at one, so I might give you a call. All right, cool, man. All right, Kay. All right. All right. Jaden flies to Denver, Colorado, then drives 90 minutes northeast to Fort Morgan for the big showdown with Chris. That evening, he calls with an update. Turns out he has a showdown not with Chris, but with Chris's mom, Jade, who just recently lost an election for the local city council. Hi, right, man. Look, so I don't know what's going on. Um, I talked to her. I, I talked to her through the door. Um, she's like, "Come back tomorrow." I'm like, "Please." I came all the way out here. Let me talk to you just for a few minutes. I'm trying to help. And then, you know, I get on the phone with Chris Merez. He's like, "Oh, he's not even there. She's just stonewalling you. She's just trying to delay you from figuring out what you're going to do. That's why she wants you to come back tomorrow." So I don't fucking know anymore. Jaden goes on to tell me that Chris's father believes that Chris is actually back in L.A. The LAPD, on the other hand, 
seem to be giving mixed signals. They continue to tell Nora that they have all these detectives, all these units working on it, but there's nobody else here. I mean, I'm looking around his house. There's no surveillance units. There's nothing. I don't know whether LAPD is telling me this just to lead me on some wild goose chase or they have no clue where he's at. But now it's like, what the fuck? I mean, what do I do? Do I stay up here? There's like a blizzard coming into town. There's no hotel rooms here. I don't know whether I'm going to stay tonight and then try to meet with her tomorrow or get back and try to figure out if he's back in L.A. Chris's fiance Mary, has been on the run with Chris pretty much this whole time. And right now, Jaden and Adea's friends believe that either she's in on this with him or he's confessed something to her. Whatever he knows, Mary likely knows as well. It seems like the only person who's been cooperative in Chris's inner circle in any way with Jaden or the police or me is his father, Chris Merez. Everyone else just seems to be protecting him. So the last thing I'm going to do before I make my decision, I, I'm going to put a, a ping request in. You know, we have a service, obviously, that gives us the, the pings. So I'll put a request in. It takes about usually 30 minutes to get that back. Um, I'll see if they can get a ping on the cell phone. And then, you know, I guess, depending on wh- where it shows, uh, we'll make a decision. Uh, I'll let you know. All right, all right, man. Okay, all right, sounds good, Jaden. I'll talk to you later. If you're not already worried about your privacy, you should be. Jaden has just made a deal with a company in Canada, and as a private investigator, he can give them any phone number, get them to ping that phone, and the company will then give Jaden the exact location of the phone, even if it's off. It's a massive privacy violation. But it also happens to be really useful right now, so I'm a little bit conflicted, especially when Jaden calls back with Chris's location. You said you pinged his phone. Where is it in California, his phone? Santa Monica. Where, uh, do you have an address in Santa Monica? I'm like, I'm driving that direction right now. It's on Pinko. Um, uh, I'll tell you that number is. It's on, uh, The police can't talk to Chris Spots because he has a lawyer. Adea's friends can't talk to Chris Spots because he's not returning their calls. Jaden can't talk to Chris Spots because he's in Colorado, and Chris is here in L.A. at this address in Santa Monica. And not only am I the only person left here who can possibly speak with him, but I just happen to be one mile away. While I'm driving to Chris's location, Jaden and I discuss a plan to reach out to the only other person we really need to speak with right now, Mary. So Jaden texts her saying he has important new information to share that may help her understand what's going on. But Mary doesn't text him back. At least it's in her ear. I actually like the fact that she didn't respond. You know, it's better than, no. <laughs> you know what I mean? At least like she's leaving the door open a little bit. I know she's getting my messages. You know, we're surveilling her for oh, a couple no, days. No, she did, she did respond to me. Shit. She said, no, no thank you, and don't contact me. <laughs> wow. There you go. Beautiful. I mean, like I said, I, you know, I just, I just cure these people. As we're speaking, I pull up outside the building where Chris is believed to be staying. It's five stories with maybe about 15 apartments on each floor. All right, man, I'm going to go do this. Uh, man, it's nerve-wracking. Uh, Let me know what's going on. I'm, I'm around. All right, cool. All right, talk to you in a little bit. Bye. All right, thanks, man. All right, I'm in my car, man. I, I don't do this. I'm, 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 I'm terrified. All right. Thanks. I reach the call box. I find the unit where Chris is staying, and I dial the code. Hello? 
Hello? To Live and Die in L.A. has been a production of Tenderfoot TV and me, Neil Strauss, in conjunction with Cadence 13. The executive producers of this podcast are myself, Donald Albright, and Payne Lindsay, along with producers Alex Vespasted and Mike Rooney. Because this is an open case, anything you know about Adeya Shabani or anyone mentioned in this podcast, we want to know. Please email us at livediela at tenderfoot.tv or call us at 213-204-2073. The music and score that you've heard in this podcast is by Makeup and Vanity Set. Our theme song is Love and War by Flurry, and our show art and design are by Trevor Eiler. You can follow us on social media at Pod. Or you can find our website with bonus content at livediella.com. I want to extend a special thanks to Brian Fishback, to Rich Burner, Kevin Richter, Station 16, Oren Rosenbaum at UTA, Eric Lynn at Shangri-La, and the Nord Group. It helps a lot when you subscribe, rate, and review the podcasts that you enjoy and listen to. Our hope is to expose these stories so the missing can be found and so the perpetrators can be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Thank you for listening and for your support.